It's great to be here. Thanks all of you uh, for coming. It's really exciting, uh, as Michael said, to have a chance to do this up in Seattle. Uh, we've got a great uh, set of folks here today. I just want to give everyone a sense of who's here and how much excitement and energy there is around GraphQL and data graph technology. We're also live streaming this. I think there's five or 600 people registered who are watching from all over the world um, to learn about this stuff. So it's, it's really exciting uh, for all of us. Uh, Apollo is a special name for us. 50 years ago today, Apollo 11 launched uh, for the first manned moon mission. Uh, I've been inspired by this stuff since I was a little kid. Uh, I think part of it is just like the audacity of going to another world. Uh, part of it is national pride for signing up to do something really hard and, and pulling it off. Uh, part of it's the engineering. If, if, you're, if you're into good system design and uh, solving hard problems with uh, good technology, it doesn't get much better than this. This is a lot of kerosene uh, burning all at once. And um, I don't know, mostly I just wanted to have a chance to watch this with you. I think it's really cool. <laughs> Uh, this is 500 frames per second of, uh, of the first couple seconds of launch uh, as the, the Saturn V comes up. How about a round of applause for this? Yeah. So um, I hope some of you take some of the same inspiration. Uh, it's, it's really amazing to see um, what great technology can do our whole industry is directly downstream of this rocket and the space program and what we built for Apollo. And so I think um, it's just amazing to be able to do it on, on such a cool day. Here's another thing going up into the right. Uh, this is uh, Apollo client downloads uh, week by week. And we use that as a proxy to understand uh, the adoption of GraphQL as a whole. Apollo client's essentially the um, industry standard way of connecting GraphQL clients to a data graph. And uh, as I said earlier, we've just seen incredible momentum around this. And it's interesting to ask what's behind that. Uh, we're not talking about yarn or some technology you could adopt in a day or two. We're talking about a replacement for rest, right, rest. And uh, it's interesting to ask why there's such excitement to make such a major architectural change in how we build applications and how we connect them to our data. And we know a lot of the advantages, right? There's some performance benefits to GraphQL. Maybe you're writing less code. But I think there's something more fundamental here. Uh, it's about access to your data. And it's about getting the value out of your data. So if we look at an example of a, a modern travel application that we might build, it's more than just a modern UI. It's that we've connected the user experience to many different kinds of data, whether it's product inventory, machine learning, personalization, recommendations, real-time pricing. All of that has to come together to build a modern user experience, the kind of thing that our users expect, the kind of thing that we can build a business on top of. And if that's not enough, <clears throat> The application has to be delivered on this dizzying array now of platforms. It's not just web and mobile. It's, it's voice and IoT and the watch and embedded and CarPlay and God knows what's coming next week and just on and on and on. So we have this conundrum where we want to build a great user experience. We want to connect that user to uh, an array of data that's living in microservices, third-party APIs, wherever it may be. And we find ourselves writing a lot of plumbing, a lot of point-to-point -point connections to make all that work. There's an M by N problem here as these applications and these data sources expand. And the problem is there's no value in that plumbing. We signed up to make an amazing user experience, but what we do all day is we write REST endpoints, backends for front ends, we reuse APIs in different ways, and we're really only causing problems when we do that. It can only make the application worse if we have a security problem or performance flaw or whatever it may be. There's no value in that plumbing. And so the solution, of course, is the data graph. This is the way out. Um, and we, we throw all that away. And instead, uh, we build a, a layer that decouples our applications 
from the data that they need. And in a data graph, the applications describe what they need in the form of a GraphQL query. And the services that we have describe what they can provide in the form of a GraphQL schema. And the purpose of the graph in between is to function as a, a marketplace, almost like an Amazon Prime. As a developer building an application, I can browse the entire menu of what's in my organization. I don't have to know who built it. I didn't have to know it existed before I needed it. And I don't have to know how it gets to me and to my app. It's just a, a, a layer that lets me navigate and take advantage of all that information. And that, to me, is the really powerful driver behind all this momentum, is teams realizing, with a data graph, I can build not just faster applications. I can do it not just with fewer developers. It's that I, I can build things that weren't possible before. And I can build a, a rich experience that was just out of reach for me as a development team beforehand. There's a lot to like about this. Um, it's more than that app dev velocity. It's also, this lets us have a far more consistent user experience. Uh, we'll hear more about that later today because instead of duplicating code inside each client, I can centralize a lot of the concerns, not just around the business logic, but the whole presentation layer of my app into the data graph. And I think even more exciting and looking for their future, this is gonna give me a deeper understanding of how my data is being used than I've ever had before. We'll see some examples of that, but the fact that we have this fine-grained knowledge is really powerful, a really exciting uh, opportunity to move beyond what was, what was possible with REST APIs and these point-to-point -point connections we've, we've lived with in the past. So what we want to do today, more than anything, is talk about how you adopt this technology. What's the journey like for going from that first application all the way through your entire organization being built on a data graph. And I hope what comes out of this is that a lot of this is about how you build software. It's about process and workflow and communication and collaboration. And it's a big change to some of what we do compared to how it works in a world where there are fixed REST APIs and, and we build apps on top of that. You're going to need some technology along the way, too. We'll talk about that. But I want you to get in the mindset that this journey is mostly about how you build software and how you collaborate on what your data means and how you're going to provide it um, to the developers who are going to take advantage of it. The first step of, of this process, and I, I suspect many of you are, are here, and it's why you came today, um, is really about that first feature on a data graph. This is all about learning the technology. This is about learning GraphQL, the query language, it's about learning the tools that allow you to take advantage of this structured data and how you're going to consume it. Um, and the prize here is seeing your own data that already lives in your core APIs structured as a graph that you can query. That's the magical moment. And then plumb that into your user interface so that you can see the whole end-to-end -end development experience and the whole way that this simplifies the, the code you used to have to write by hand. Um, a big part of this story is the tooling. So we're going we're gonna to have um, some demos of this later today. As a product engineer, this trio of technologies, a component library like React, a data technology like Apollo, backed by strong typing, is an incredible, far more productive development experience. And I think part of what may uh, be exciting to see is that it goes beyond the ability to type some GraphQL instead of handwrite some fetching code. You're going to see a whole lot of benefits. Um, and I see some heads nodding for some of you who've seen this um, in terms of the, the amount of structure you can bring and the velocity you get because of that and the kind of rich collaboration and reusability um, that comes with having that. As just one example, and, and we'll see more of this, we can wire in a lot of the fine-grained information that we have in the data graph into our editor right at development time. We can see how much a query is going to cost us in terms of milliseconds as we type it, because we have this predictive ability based on what we've seen other queries running on the graph look like. And to have that knowledge at your fingertips as you're building your application, rather than seeing it two months later once you rolled out into production, um, is incredibly powerful. The second phase of the journey is about going into production with that first key product. And this is really where you start to see the big benefits of a data graph. This is when you get to delete a back end for a front end or remove a bunch of old REST code that you don't want to maintain any longer. 
Um, and this is really about establishing the patterns for how you're gonna roll this out in the future. The workflows that you're gonna use in your organization for development, um, and the operational practices you're gonna put in place to protect uh, and maintain that graph um, as its use expands. There's great news here. We have worked with hundreds of companies that have gone down this path, and what's emerged um, in our conversations are a set of best practices for how to build and maintain and expand a data graph in production. Um, and my co-founder Jeff and I have written up a summary of these at principledgraphql.com. I won't go through each of these here today, but the point is there are answers. There's now clarity about the right architecture and the right way to think about structuring how you're gonna build a graph. One thing that emerges that I wanna um, emphasize is the importance of taking a product-first approach to designing this graph. And what I mean by that is that you really wanna think about your graph as something that serves the exact needs of the products and the user experiences that you're trying to build. In other words, you're gonna start with the screen that you want. And you wanna work backwards from that to ask, what graph, what structure of data best serves that need? And you wanna build exactly that, no more, no less. And then map that to the services, the actual capabilities that provide the actual data or the uh, RPCs that you're gonna to have to consume. It's tempting with an API technology to go the other direction, right? It's tempting to start with your core APIs and then build the, the semantic graph of all my data in exactly the right shape. And what we've found over and again is that teams that take a, the, the other approach um, bump into a lot of friction because they don't end up with a graph that's optimized for what a product team really wants to consume to build that technology. So I wanna leave you with that nugget. Make sure that you're involving your product engineers from day one. Make sure there's a strong collaboration and a thoughtful approach to how you're gonna design that. And make sure that you've got an agile process because you're gonna add more and more applications, more and more user experiences that depend on the graph over time. And as you do that, you're gonna to wanna to change the graph. You're gonna to wanna to add more to it. You're gonna to wanna to change some of the structure of what you already have. And you're gonna want tooling and, and workflows to help you do that. Here's an example of one of those. Uh, this is called schema change validation. It's part of the Apollo platform. And what we're looking at here is what happens when a developer makes a change to a data graph that's not compatible with the applications that are in the field. And what's really cool about GraphQL is that we can check for that compatibility statically at development time. There's an algebra that we can run. We know what the structure of the graph is. We know the type of every field. And we know exactly what queries the applications that are consuming the graph are issuing. We have a log, a structured log of every one of those. And so based on that information, we can actually do this calculus of if you want to change this field to this type, or if you want to add this to the enum, or if you want to do something with an input type, we can enumerate the exact list of clients that would be affected by that change and give you all the information you need to either take a different approach at the graph level or collaborate with the consumers of the graph so that everything can move forward. And this stuff isn't as simple as just like, don't remove a field that somebody's using. There's a lot of subtlety to the sorts of changes that you can make in a graph and a lot of structure that we can take advantage of to give each team an agile process for evolving that graph over time without breaking the consumers of the graph. One thing that happens as you go down this path is you're gonna start to see more and more apps querying the graph that you as a developer may not have known about. That's the whole prize in some sense. So you'll want the structure in place to be able to protect yourself from the development process that you're, you're taking. Here's another example of a, a tool that you'll want in production. We call this safe listing. And the idea here is simple. It's wonderful that you can write an arbitrary GraphQL query to consume data any way you like in development. But in production, you probably don't want to do that. You probably don't want a GraphQL endpoint on the internet that accepts an arbitrary query of arbitrary cost or complexity, right? So the model we, uh, uh, advocate for is where you register the queries that your trusted developers are writing in development, and then your graph manager pushes that configuration into your data graph layer as a manifest or a, a, a whitelist or a safe list of all the different queries that you can um, accept in production. These are examples of tools and workflows that aren't part of the core 
technology for executing a GraphQL query or for consuming a GraphQL query in a UI, these are things that live in what we call a graph manager, a set of management tools that sit alongside your query execution layer to give you the full benefits of the data graph. And so this is a, a diagram of, of how we structure this in Apollo. The Apollo platform really has three pieces. There's some open source that implements the core query execution and query consumption technology. I think almost everyone here knows about Apollo Client and Apollo Server. There is a graph manager, which is a set of services that implement things like schema change management, safe listing, and some other things we're going to show you today. And then there's a set of integrations that hook off of that graph manager to systems like VS Code, Slack, GitHub, PagerDuty, whatever. And what we want to show you today is whether you use this or build some of this uh, yourself, this is critical to having a data graph that multiple developers are collaborating on that you can roll out into production and evolve over time in an agile and safe way. OK. That takes us to the third stage. So if the first stage is getting your, your hands dirty with GraphQL technology and the end-to-end -end development environment, and the second stage is about putting that first critical strategic application into production on the graph, what comes next is really interesting and something I want to spend a few minutes on, which is scaling the graph. How do you go from something that basically one team built to something that the entire organization can share? As a, as a shared strategic layer of the stack that gives you these benefits across everything you're building. And this is where the extraordinary benefits and the real prize of data graph come into play. Because now we have consistency across the org, we have reusability across the org, and we can take advantage of all the things I've talked about, even for teams that don't know much about the graph or how it's implemented. And it goes something like this, you start small, and then you expand, because that mobile team next door to you thinks, well, wait a second, can't I query the same graph you just wrote for the web app? And then maybe the adjacent internal tools team takes advantage of it, and they had to add a little bit to the graph to support their use case. And then maybe you go on from there, and pretty soon you've got something that spans the entire organization. And the conundrum here is, how do you do this without introducing a big monolith or a central choke point for development? Because the idea that we're going to roll out a big GraphQL server that sits in front of every single API we have and sits behind every single application we ship doesn't quite add up. You need a story for how you're going to do that in a safe and distributed way with a large team. Um, I was remiss earlier in not thanking um, Dan and, and Jim and Shane and the Expedia team. Uh, we've been working together for many months now on exactly this problem. Um, they're here today, and you're going to hear directly from uh, them about their experience building this. Um, and what Expedia has done is really exciting. They have built a federated data graph. They've built a data graph where the implementation isn't a monolith, but it's actually distributed across multiple GraphQL services that are composed together into one graph. And I want to show you what that looks like and how we've thought about this problem. So the way we think about this is you, you want to split your graph architecture into two layers with separate responsibilities. Uh, one layer is a set of services, each of which implement part of your graph. And in this example, we have a product service, a reviews service, an account service. And the key idea here is that each of these is going to be owned and managed by a separate team, possibly with a completely different development cycle, maybe with a different set of technologies. And each of them is going to encapsulate a certain concept, a certain set of concerns that fit together. The other part of the layer is infrastructure that's shared across the organization, a gateway. And the role of the gateway is to join these together into a single graph and let you execute queries against that as if it were one graph. And internally, what it's going to do is it's going to break that query into pieces, and some of it's going to go to the product service, and some going to go to the account service, and so on. This is technology that we've been working on for a long time. We built a, a tool called Schema Stitching some years ago that was a first attempt at this. But Schema Stitching had some real limitations. Um, and we've, we've been working over the last couple months on something that we're really excited about called Apollo Federation, which takes a much more principled and thoughtful approach to the problem based on our experience working with um, many of these teams. Um, Apollo Federation gets you that proper separation of concerns, where the code for each part of the graph lives in one service, separate from the others, and decoupled in terms of its development. 
it gets you um, no code in the gateway. So you can roll out a gateway as a piece of shared infrastructure, just like your Kafka infrastructure, that individual developers who are using it don't have to touch day to day as they build out the graph. And it gets you this agile way of building the graph without having to have that single monolith. So very end of May, we released the open source core of Apollo Federation. Uh, James is going to demo this for you in, in just a moment. And uh, it really came in two pieces, support for the server to uh, expose a partial graph, and an open source gateway that can stitch that together into a single composed graph and execute queries. Um, a lot of teams have already adopted this in production. We're now running, I think, uh, closing in on about 10,000 downloads a week of this technology. Uh, so the, the uh, adoption has been really exciting. Cheerful, for example, uh, in Denver has moved from their production GraphQL layer using schema stitching to using the Apollo Federation technology in production, and they've been able to eliminate a lot of the, the fragile stitching code as a result of that. There's another half of the story, though, and what we've just released today is what we call managed federation. And managed federation is the other piece of the puzzle. It's the tools and the workflows, the stuff that lives in the graph manager that helps you coordinate and collaborate on a large distributed graph. And these are all about how do I organize my development process, how do I wire up my DevOps process, and how do I manage and monitor what ends up now being a distributed system that my entire team is sharing. And I want to show you an example of what that looks like. So at the heart of this is, is a list of services that implement your graph. And so from the graph manager, for example, um, we can get the list of implementing services for a graph. Each of them is going to be a separate microservice running somewhere. And uh, we can start to track the history of those over time and the partial graph that each of them implements. And you'll see all of this in, in more detail, and, and uh, it's all up on the Apollo documentation now, something you can play with, and, and, and we hope you take a look. There's some workflows that that enables, and I'll, I'll just give you a taste of this. We talked about schema change control earlier. Schema change control in a distributed graph is even more important because I'm going to have multiple teams each working on a particular piece of the graph. And in this example, if the product team makes a change to its part of the graph, what we need to be able to do is first compose that with the rest of the services that make up the whole graph, and then test that in development against the known use of the graph as a whole. And Managed Federation does that. So you'll see an example of how we can catch a incompatibility at build time, even in the context of just one service that makes up the complete graph. Here's the other key workflow. When you want to make a change that is good, how do you coordinate with the other teams and with the overall GraphQL gateway? What we see at a lot of companies is the rise of not just microservices, but cloud-native technology like Envoy or Istio or Spinnaker that allow teams to have really sophisticated deployment strategies for each of their microservices. And the GraphQL implementing services are no exception. So a managed, <coughs> excuse me, a managed federation architecture is one that allows you to coordinate the rollout of an individual service with an update to the overall graph schema that your organization uses. And the upshot is a team that owns the review service, for example, can publish a change using their existing tools and workflows. They don't need administrative access to the gateway. Instead, the manager recomposes the new schema based on the latest definition of the graph from each service, and then pushes that configuration into the gateway, which can then smoothly transition clients from the old schema and the old set of services to the new schema and the new set of services. And so the prize here is this agile decoupled development process that everyone's looking for. You no longer have a single point of failure. You no longer have that fragile user code. And you've allowed each team to iterate at its own pace and on its own schedule. But together, what you've built is a strategic asset for the whole organization, something that applications can consume no matter um, which team they're on or which parts of the graph they're most interested in. And they consume it without knowing the implementation details of what data lives in what service. So we're really excited about this. This is something that's been, um, 
I'd say, a long time coming. And if I can come back to the principles for just a moment, the first three principles that we've talked about, kind of the, the, the bedrock of a data graph strategy for a company that's thinking about scale, is you want one graph for your whole company, but you want a distributed implementation of that graph. And that means you need a place to track the history of that graph that's separate from its own implementation. Those first three are really the keys to success when you're in that scale phase of building out a large graph. And with Managed Federation, we think we've got it. We think we've got the building blocks that teams need to be able to roll forward with this technology incrementally uh, and successfully. So we'll talk more about this over the course of the day. We're all here to um, answer questions and, of course, um, as I said, uh, tons of documentation and examples online of, of how this works and, and how you can get started. And let me leave with, with one last stage. If we've built a graph, and the graph spans the org, and now we've got something that exposes the, the real meaning of our data and makes it visible, it's interesting to think about what you can do beyond just developing applications. And we've seen some examples of this starting to emerge in lots of companies, and it's stuff that uh, for us is a big part of our roadmap and how we want to think about the future of data graph. A really good example are public and partner APIs, right? Why would I make my partners consume data through these narrow straws? Why don't I just give them the graph? And that's a really exciting direction. There are some examples like GitHub and Shopify that have had public GraphQL APIs, um, and the benefits to the partner ecosystem are, are really extraordinary. If you're thinking about your own company as a platform, maybe more and more, and less about the actual apps that you're shipping, this is a really interesting direction to think about um, and, and to set the stage for. You're also going to find a lot of use of the graph that isn't just an application. Um, we've found teams at many of our uh, customers that are coming in Monday morning and they discover a script or a little internal admin tool or something that someone's written that consumes the graph, because why not? And so it's exciting to think about a world where uh, a BI team or a customer support team can directly consume the graph or write a little piece of software to use the data graph instead of having to block on software development. And we all know how painful it can be to get those sort of other line of business apps or internal tools built. I think the graph is a really interesting opportunity to simplify that and to expose data to more of the company beyond just the application engineers. And finally, um, I'll leave you with this thought. If the graph gives us this really precise knowledge of who's consuming our data and how they're consuming it and how that changes over time, I think that has extraordinary implications for security and privacy and, and um, legal questions like GDPR, right? We know that the expectations now for development teams are higher than ever in terms of being responsible uh, stewards of the data that we own. And I think what we're going to find is that the data graph becomes a really natural place to enforce policy and to get our individual development teams out of the business of having to bake some of these ideas into the code itself and instead letting it be something that we can think of as a governance layer on top of the data we have. And that's, I think, a, a really exciting direction. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming. I want to encourage you. Um, to ask questions and learn from each other today. This is an event that uh, we're really excited about and uh, um, hope you uh, get a lot out of it. Thank you very much.